Okay, so let's uh, begin this uh, session by uh, recalling uh, what we did last time, so where we left off. So if you remember, I was discussing the Brachistochrone problem, which is basically the problem of finding the path in a uniform gravitational field of an object uh, such that uh, it takes the minimum amount of time for the particle to reach uh, the starting point uh, which is at an elevation and uh, the end point which is uh, at a lower level. So uh, your naive guess that it should be a straight line connecting those two points is uh, going to be wrong because uh, that would of course be correct if there was no gravitational field. So when there is a gravitational field, it is not at all clear what that should be. So let us try and see uh, what is the um, correct answer to this question. So if you remember, we spent a lot of time uh, deriving the time taken for the mass to reach uh, uh, the end point starting from the elevation. So, so this equation 1.102 right, tells you uh, what that time taken is. So the left hand side capital T is the duration the mass spends uh, on its journey. So x is the horizontal uh, displacement of the mass. So x equal to 0 corresponds to the starting uh, horizontal position and x equal to L is uh, where it ends up. So and then y of x is correspondingly the, the path uh, the particle takes. So for every x between 0 and L there is a y uh, which will determine what the path is. So we just uh, showed that the time taken is basically given by this formula where h is the y value when uh, x is 0. Okay. So in other words the height uh, with which it starts off. So bottom line is that um, this uh, has to be minimized. So then if you change, so this is a functional. So capital T is a functional of y, the path. So you change the function y, you get a different answer. So t is a number, y is a function. So you change the function y, you get a different number for t. So, so therefore t is a functional of y and then you keep changing y until you reach a situation then t is uh, the minimum possible value. So to determine that you make the assertion that uh, the variation in t, so basically if you remember your calculus, uh, a function is uh, minimum if its first derivative is 0 at some point. So similarly a function null is minimum if its uh, variation with respect to changes, small changes in the function itself is 0 for that uh, particular desirable function which minimizes that uh, uh, time duration. So in other words, if y star is the function which minimizes the time duration, then delta t equals 0 whenever y is exactly that desirable function y star which basically is the path the particle takes. So that time taken is minimum. So we use the conventional uh, rules of calculus to find delta t just like you would find delta of x you take the derivative but here you take the functional derivative with respect to y. But uh, keep in mind here that uh, you have to uh, even though you are varying the fun function y you are finding different functions that minimize t but then you have to keep in mind that uh, those different functions should uh, start at the same location and end up at the same location. It is only the shape of the function that changes. So the question we are asking is that given the end points are fixed, so this, uh, the end points at the start is x equal to 0, y equal to h, uh, finishes x equal to l and y equal to 0. So if that is the case, uh, then uh, you see variations in the path will be significant only uh, far away from the uh, end points because in, in end points all the different possible paths converge. So that is the reason why I have written that uh, the delta of y's, so the variation in y, so delta of y is the difference between the y values for two different paths 
which are close to each other. So the delta of y is basically 0, it is exactly 0 at the starting point and at the ending point. So keep in mind, so keeping this in mind, we can go ahead and find the uh, variation in t. So remember that t depends on uh, two uh, unrelated uh, variables, namely y itself and its derivative. So y and y, y dash can be very different from one another, especially for some arbitrary curve. At this stage, we do not know what y is. So y can be anything, so y and y dash are completely unrelated. So if you want to f uh, find the variation in t, you have to first differentiate with respect to y and then uh, find the derivative with respect to the with, with respect to y dash and multiply with respect to the multiply with the variation in y dash because y and y dash are at this stage unrelated. Okay, so, so now I am going to do the following. I am going to rewrite uh, uh, this. So basically I am going to think of this as d by dx of uh, delta y. Then I am going to uh, take this derivative outside, but then I will be making a mistake by doing that because then I will get a spurious derivative with respect to this which I will cancel out by putting in a minus sign. So I, I got this spurious term which I am by hand cancelling out. So if I, I really want to take the derivative outside for obvious reasons then this becomes the integral of a derivative which I know how to do. But then the price I have to pay is that it introduces this term which was not there earlier which I have to necessarily get rid of by subtracting it out this way. So uh, bottom line is that uh, when I do this that you see uh, this is easy because uh, the integral of the derivative is this function itself and this function itself is being evaluated at x equal to 0 and x equal to L. I just told you that delta y is 0 at x equal to 0 and it is uh, also 0 at x equal to L because that is the change in y for different uh, values of x. So having gotten rid of this middle term, we can just go ahead and combine this and uh, you know separate out or uh, you know take this delta y as common factor outside and then we get this uh, this nice looking formula for the variation in the time duration or the time taken for the uh, for the mass to end up at this end point starting from its initial location. So uh, keep in mind that uh, so this is going to be 0 okay so the the bottom line is that this delta t should be 0 for any change in y so that means that regardless of uh, what this delta y is, this should still be 0. So for any delta y obeying the constraint delta y at x equal to 0 equals delta y at x equal to L equals 0. So, so long as that is obeyed, uh, this delta t should be 0 for every delta y which obeys those end point constraints. So that is going to happen only if uh, this itself is 0. Okay. So that is precisely what uh, uh, will determine the, uh, the path that the particle will take in order to minimize the time duration, uh, the time it takes for it to reach the end point. So this is analogous to the Lagrange equation. So if you recall, so there was a situation where this was the, so if instead of x you imagine it was time and you imagine this capital T is your Lagrangian, then what would this correspond to? This is d by dt of uh, dl by dq dot equals uh, d by dq of l. So imagine this is q, imagine this is l, then imagine this is t and this is uh, q dot. So this is going to be dl by dq dot d by dt dl by dq. So, so Lagrange equations, uh, this is not surprising because Lagrange equations themselves are uh, a consequence of an extremum principle. Okay, uh, so bottom line is that we really have to work this out. Okay, so now let's work this out. So if you work this out, uh, delta 
t by delta y dash is just this. So you think of y and y dash as two independent variables because now we know what uh, t is. T is this. So just work out the uh, derivatives. Okay. So so delta delta t by delta y dash is this, and delta t by delta y is this. So then uh, you just substitute uh, these two into your Euler Lagrange equation, which is this one. Okay. So which will then tell you the equation that y of x has to obey this equation in order for t should to be minimum. So if t has to be a minimum, y has to obey this equation. Well, uh, there are some technical issues uh, which mean that you can uh, avoid the second derivative uh, type of equation uh, which is somewhat complicated to deal with. So you can actually uh, work with a just like uh, you know you can avoid uh, solving the second order Newton's uh, second law equation by uh, so that is what the Lagrange equations would be it would be second order in time. So you can avoid that by uh, using the Hamiltonian approach where the Hamiltonian you know is a constant and that is uh, basically equal to uh, you know p and q and p is itself uh, first order in the generalized coordinate the f first time derivative of the generalized coordinate. So similarly uh, even in this case you can do this uh, and uh, analogous uh, idea in the in this context is called the Beltrami identity. Okay. So that is analogous to using uh, energy conservation. So that is uh, so when you do that uh, you get this sort of an equation. So I will allow you to go through the details uh, yourself from the notes in the book. So I, I otherwise it is a little bit technical I do not want to bore you with the details. So bottom line is that you can uh, you know introduce the analog of uh, the Hamiltonian and uh, make the assertion that that Hamiltonian is a constant. So here also there is some analog of that and uh, that is going to be a constant and then so the equation is going to simplify a lot. So instead of being second order like it was earlier it is going to be first order. Okay. So, um, so the first order equation that uh, I am going to be required to solve is 1.119 which is this one. Okay. So that is not difficult to solve uh, because uh, you can uh, easily see that uh, the solution that we are looking for has this parametric form. Okay. So, uh, so you can uh, just go ahead and substitute this and you will see that uh, it is obeyed. Okay. So, of course, uh, you might think that that is a little too quick. So, well, you can do it the long way, but bottom line is uh, this is a very standard problem and everybody knows the answer to this. So, nobody spends too much time uh, understanding how these uh, answers were arrived at. But bottom line is that uh, you know worst case you can just assume this is the answer and substitute this back into the equation and then convince yourself that this is indeed the solution. So you see uh, it also obeys so we have to of course this uh, these the, it involves some integration constants uh, like capital A and all that. So we have to relate that to some other things that we are more familiar with. So. Uh, so now uh, assume that Tf is the time taken for the uh, mass to reach the end point. In that case you can see that uh, this Tf and A are linked in this manner. So this is going to be this because remember at the end point y is 0 and in the beginning uh, so uh, well at the end point of x is L and y is 0. So that is how it uh, looks. Okay. So that is going to indirectly tell you what the time duration is and, and you can be guaranteed that this time duration that you uh, arrive at by solving uh, these equations. So that means by L, so now there are two unknowns Tf and A but then there are two equations this and this. So you can eliminate them and get both 
uh, of course tf is more interesting uh, so uh, so that will tell you the time duration tf is the time the mass takes to slide from its starting point uh, to its ending point and the path it takes is what is called a catenary right so that's the path uh, uh, it takes so and the time duration is tf and is guaranteed to be a minimum okay so this is one nice application of uh, uh, the variational method and you can see that it involves uh, the use of functional derivatives and uh, that's basically the uh, infinite dimensional version of uh, the ordinary derivative which is why it um, deserves to be under this chapter which is titled countable and uncountable so i'm just trying to introduce you to the concept of uh, fields through an example where the number of degrees of freedom are uh, infinite and this is one such example where you have a functional it depends on infinitely many variables in a continuous way okay so the other uh, example of uh, functional calculus so the earlier one was the brachistochrone problem the other example is uh, the fermat's principle in optics so even the fermat's principle in optics is similar uh, he stated that the time duration to go from uh, so if you imagine a beam of light passing through uh, a refractive medium the time duration for the light to uh, reach uh, from its starting to ending point is uh, is the one which minimizes basically the time taken so uh, by the time taken is basically the distance traveled divided by speed and then speed is of course a function of the refractive index so then if you go ahead and uh, write v as c by n you are going to get this as your time taken but then your refractive index can be path dependent so basically it depends on uh, what path your light takes so imagine that your path taken is determined by uh, x so so it's a path is by definition a one parameter family of points and that parameterization can be done by choosing z as your parameter so z is the z coordinate of the point so that itself can serve as a parameter in which case uh, x and y depend on z so therefore it gives you a one parameter family of points which is basically a path so uh, so now uh, what you are going to do is you are going to be called upon to um, minimize a function like this so now this is a functional of not just one unknown function like x or y but it's a function of both of them x and y both so the question is so how do you do that of course you do it the same way when you keep repeating your your uh, approaches means you differentiate with respect to one of them and you differentiate with respect to the other subsequently so uh, i'm not going to bore you with the details but bottom line is that just like that beltrami type of idea you can apply it uh, the similar type of ideas here also and uh, you can uh, then derive some analogous equations okay so uh, i have applied this idea to study a reflection okay so for example the, so this idea can be used to study um, various uh, or not just study but derive uh, various laws which are well known in optics such as the law of reflection then snell's law of refraction and so on so i have uh, used this idea to derive uh, the law of reflection so that means angle of incidence is same as angle of reflection so that can be proven uh, by so you don't have to assume that you can think of that as a consequence of fermat's principle okay so uh, so i have uh, just gone ahead and do it I, i i don't want to spend too much time discussing the details you can read it yourself so similarly i have uh, uh, i have studied uh, refraction uh, so you have two media one of them is homogeneous with refractive index n1 but then there is a surface uh, beyond which uh, there is another medium homogeneous with refractive n2 so the inhomogeneity is abrupt at the surface 
So when light is incident on the surface interface between these two media, then uh, you will see that uh, there is not only refraction which you expect, there is also an, a reflection. So whenever you have uh, an interface between two media, you also have reflection. So then you can work out, you can derive both these. Uh, so Snell's law, uh, rather Fermat's principle directly tells you that uh, not only is there a refraction that is going on that obeys Snell's law, but for Fermat's principle also for the same effort uh, tells you that there is a reflection going on that obeys the laws of reflection, namely the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. But of course, as you very well know, the angle of refraction is certainly not equal to the angle of incidence because that is going to be determined by Snell's law and the a relative refractive index across the medium, across the two media. Okay, so that's the bottom line. So, so you get this uh, famous Snell's law: n one sine theta one equals n two sine theta two. So, this is a consequence of Fermat's principle. So, even in Fermat's principle, you can see that uh, the derivation of Snell's law and the law of reflection involves. Uh, first writing down the uh, time taken as the minimum and as an extremum of some functional and then uh, deriving uh, the form of that functional in different situations. Okay, so, this is another example of functional calculus which is basically uh, another way of thinking about um, systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, the last example is, uh, is the least square fit, which of course uh, is uh, more obvious and I, I'll, I think I will skip this because it has less to do with infinitely many degrees of freedom, it is closer to what we were basically it is just another way of minimizing the error and so on. But it, since it has uh, less relevance to systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom, I am going to skip it. But I included it just because uh, you know it has wide uh, applications in many areas of physics and engineering. Okay, so uh, so basically, you know, the end of this chapter has several exercises, as you can see here in page 35. Uh, there are several exercises which are very important, and I have spent a considerable amount of effort in creating these exercises and. Uh, and as the publisher insists of course that there should also be s detailed solutions to each of these questions and which is available with the publisher. So, uh, so it is not like these questions have just been thrown at you and there are no solutions possible. So, I have made sure that each of them can be solved and there are sensible solutions available if you are interested in knowing what they are. So, I, I strongly urge you to uh, work out these questions on your own and contact me if you have any uh, doubts about any of those answers. Okay, so, uh, so now I am going to go ahead and uh, jump to another topic which is extremely important and that topic is basically uh, the idea of symmetries and how they lead to conservation loss. So, you can see that you know the word symmetry is a very familiar one and we use it in our everyday conversations. So, symmetries are ubiquitous in nature. So, we uh, admire for example, the symmetrical and intricate patterns on the wings of a butterfly, uh, the simple and symmetrical, I am just reading off this uh, paragraph. Uh, so, the simple and symmetrical ripples formed on the surface of still water which is a simpler type of symmetry and then uh, yeah, so there are several such uh, visual symmetries that you can uh, think of that you encounter constantly in your everyday life. But then symmetries are not restricted to visual phenomena. So, there are other types of uh, experiences which are also uh, which also lend themselves to description in terms of symmetries. For example, in music. So, uh, in music uh, typically pleasing uh, composition will have a phrase that uh, repeats uh, frequent or periodically and uh, that is pleasing to the ear and even drums. So, you have 
drums when they are played, you know, there, there is a pattern which repeats uh, and that pattern before it repeats, it can be quite intricate and uh, complicated, but then, then the same pattern repeats and that, that is typically uh, a hallmark of uh, some melodious piece of music. So, if, if there is no repetition of any kind, we usually don't think of such uh, uh, auditory experiences as being musical. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, some sort of a symmetry is there uh, in all of our day-to-day uh, -day experiences and uh, it looks like the human uh, biology is uh, uniquely tuned to uh, be sensitive and pick up on these symmetries. So, they are very um, good at uh, picking up on these symmetries. So, we can actually uh, define mathematically the notion of symmetry can be made quite rigorous uh, by defining symmetry as uh, the property of an object that is unchanged uh, under some transformation. So, so, I define symmetry as the property of an object which remains unchanged uh, if I do a certain transformation. Uh, so, I have given this example, it is not an example that you usually encounter in other places, but I found this interesting. For example, a palindrome, so palindrome is basically a word which looks the same uh, if you read it backwards, but then that is exactly the symmetry that I am discussing. So, then you flip the, the first, first letter with the last, the second with the penultimate one and so on you get back the same word. So, there is a, the palindromic words are symmetrical or invariant under this particular transformation, but they are not symmetrical under other types of transformations. For example, you replace the odd letters with the even ones and so on. So, the message there is that symmetries, uh, so in other words, uh, objects are symmetrical only under certain specific set of transformations they may not be under other sets of transformation. So, we have to be, we cannot make a blanket statement this object is symmetrical, you have to say under what transformation. So, we can of course, uh, so these are all visual type of symmetries which are easy to uh, appreciate, but in uh, mathematics and physics we uh, encounter more abstract kinds of symmetries and these symmetries are the mathematical symmetries which leave certain physical quantities unchanged. So, for example, if, uh, so if you have a Lagrangian uh, which depends upon some generalized coordinates and uh, if Q uh, denotes the collection of all generalized coordinates, uh, we may imagine a transformation uh, which changes all those generalized coordinates to some other coordinates. So, so q gets mapped to q of s, where s is some continuous variable. So, you, I continuously deform each of those generalized coordinate uh, to some other, some other one. Now, um, so suppose uh, I can do that and yet if the Lagrangian remains the same even after I do that. So, that is somewhat surprising. So, you should be able to uh, find a continuous transformation that uh, transforms your generalized coordinates into uh, some other set of generalized coordinates continuously. So, that means all the intermediate set of coordinates are also legitimate generalized coordinates and then you reach uh, the end set of generalized coordinates and you ask yourself does the Lagrangian of the final set of generalized coordinates is it the same as what it was earlier. If the answer is yes, then that is uh, that's a kind of symmetry and that is a kind of continuous symmetry that, that means that the Lagrangian is unchanged under a continuous symmetry. So, uh, so you might be thinking this is very unusual and very hard to find perhaps but uh, you will be surprised that it is not uh, hard to find. In fact, uh, it occurs very frequently. For example, imagine uh, I have a, a particle in two dimensions described by position coordinate x comma y. 
So, x, x bracket t represents the position, x position of the particle at time t and y bracket t is the position, y position at time t. So, that is the position vector of the particle in two dimensions at uh, time t. So, now I am going to ask myself what if I rotate my coordinate system. So, at, at every time I rotate my coordinate system by an angle theta. So, then I am going to, what I am going to do is when I do that, I uh, will be describing the particle not in terms of x, x and y, but rather in terms of x theta and y theta. And x theta and y theta are basically linear combinations of x and y. Okay? So, this is an example of a continuous transformation. Okay? So, this is an example of a continuous transformation. Now, the question is that if uh, you are able to find a Lagrangian of a system which is unchanged under continuous transformation. So, in other words, your L x y x dot y dot is same as L x theta y theta x dot theta y dot theta. So, remember that Lagrangian is a function of q and q dot. So, in, in my case, in this present case, uh, q is nothing but x comma y and uh, q dot is uh, nothing but x dot comma y dot. So, if uh, your L of x comma y, x dot comma y dot is same as x theta comma y theta and x dot theta comma y dot theta. So, that means you replace x by x theta y by y theta if your Lagrangian is unchanged, then you call uh, this as continuous symmetry. So, that means it is a symmetry of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is unchanged by this transformation. So, why am I even mentioning this? So, what means? Sure, you can perhaps find such uh, Lagrangians which do this. Okay. So, now uh, the uh, main point here is that if uh, so, this is the famous Noether's theorem. So, what Noether's theorem says is that if such a transformation is uh, exists, then you will be able to find a quantity which of the dynamical system that you are looking at, which is described by that particular Lagrangian, you will be able to find a, a quantity that is conserved. That means, it does not change with time. So, that is a remarkable statement because you see conserved quantities are very important in dynamical systems and they are often uh, hard to guess except uh, very obvious ones like energy and so on. But uh, there are other uh, quantities which are hard to guess. So, uh, it is nice to know that you do not have to guess rather what you have to do is uh, you have to look for symmetries of the Lagrangian and make sure those symmetries are continuous. And if they are continuous, you are guaranteed uh, to be uh, presented with uh, courtesy Noethers. Uh, you are guaranteed to be presented with a quantity that is conserved for each of those symmetries that you have uncovered. So, uh, that is amazing and it is really uh, worth knowing how that comes about. Okay, so, uh, so, let me tell you how that comes about. So, this is before I tell you how that comes about, let us uh, uh, admire this uh, wonderful portrait by the great uh, mathematician Emmy Noether, whose, whose name is associated with this famous theorem. And she was the person, a uh, mathematician who proved this theorem. And uh, Einstein uh, regarded her as one of the greatest mathematicians of her generation. So, uh, so let us now go back and see how she go, uh, proved this. And uh, the way she proved this is, uh, first let us uh, start with the obvious uh, assertion. That, that means, so we have said that there exists a continuous symmetry of the Lagrangian. So, what does that mean? So, if, if I change a q to q subscript s, so s is continuous, right? So, q has been deformed into q of s. So, even though q has deformed into q of s, which is completely different from q, and therefore q dot 
also has deformed into q dot subscript s which is also completely different from q dot so even though q and q dot have completely changed now but the lagrangian itself does not change so that is that is what we mean by symmetry so if if such a, a situation is possible so that means we have to assume that it's possible so if it is possible so now the question is what are the consequences so first let us uh, write down the assertion of the statement that it is in fact possible to do that so if that is a uh, symmetry of the Lagrangian what that means is that the um, Lagrangian does not depend on s. So, regardless of uh, how, how you have deformed whether or not you have deformed this q into q of s the Lagrangian does not care. So, its derivative with respect to s is 0. So, the Lagrangian remains unchanged even though you have deformed the q's and q dots. So, now let us see what is the consequence right of uh, of the statement so the consequence of the statement is that uh, un unfortunately i have done this twice I mean, this is redundant okay so so how do you find the derivative of l with respect to s so now l depends on s through uh, its dependence of uh, its dependence on q and q dot which each of which depend on s. So, obviously, you have to invoke the chain rule which now says that in order to find the rate of change we have to first differentiate with respect to q of s and then we differentiate with respect to s uh, that means we respect uh, differentiate q of s with respect to s similarly with q dot. But now uh, keep in mind that uh, the uh, Lagrange equations will tell you that you can make this statement that means you can write dl by dqs as d by dt of uh, dl by dq dot ok. So, that is Lagrange equation. So, I am going to make use of that and go ahead and substitute. So, instead of this I am going to write this ok. So, I am going to write this replace this with this ok. So, when I do that uh, this equation which is 0 because remember what that is that is d by d s of l which is 0. So, that is going to be uh, rewrite rewritable as this ok. So, now this is nothing but uh, so I can pull out this time derivative outside and this becomes just this ok. So, the last result follows from the fact that the derivative with respect to time and derivative with respect to s are interchangeable. So, this means that uh, since this is 0 what this means is that this quantity is uh, unchanged ok. So, remember that q is a shorthand for several generalized coordinates the system can have several generalized coordinates typically most interesting physical systems have several more than 2, 2 or more. Okay, so, uh, in that case uh, you see so this is uh, so that is the reason why I have pointed this out. So, it is uh, it's just summation over all the possible generalized coordinates. So, what Noether's theorem? So, this is Noether's theorem. So, we have just successfully proved that the moment there is a continuous symmetry it implies a conservation law and this conservation law is basically not only does it guarantee a conservation law. So, it also tells you what is conserved, what is conserved is basically this quantity. So, this quantity I have called as q and this is called the Noether's constant ok. So, so what uh, so what we have succeeded now in doing is that we have explicitly been able to construct a quantity which is conserved which does not change with time just because there is a continuous symmetry in the problem that means the moment you are able to spot a symmetry in the problem that immediately means there is a conserved quantity. So, you see the bottom line is that you know humans uh, are biologically uh, perfectly tuned uh, to spot symmetries. So, for some reason uh, it is probably an evolutionary adaptation that we can recognize symmetries faster than uh, 
most other creatures perhaps or maybe as as well as other creatures but bottom line is that uh, it's, it's something very innate and intrinsic to us and we readily appreciate symmetries so even when uh, the symmetries are abstract like they are in the lagrangian it's uh, it's not that difficult for us to spot them but however it is incredibly hard for us to spot conserved quantities in a dynamical system so that's the that's the bottom line here so the moment you are able to spot a continuous symmetry which is easy to spot because we are humans and the moment you are able to spot a continuous symmetry noether guarantees you that not only there is a conserved quantity she even tells you what it is that is conserved and that is amazing so uh, and conserved quantities are really important in physics as you very well know so in the next class i will discuss uh, the application of noether's theorem to various dynamical systems and you will see that uh, in the case of central forces well hamiltonian of the system is of course conserved but we will even identify what is the symmetry that's responsible for the conservation of hamiltonian so in fact the converse is also true like we just proved that for every conserved quantity there is a uh, or rather for every continuous symmetry there is a conserved quantity so the question is uh, the natural question is the converse true that means that uh, for every conserved quantity is there a continuous symmetry the answer is yes so in fact we will be able to identify them so we are we'll be able to identify the symmetry which makes the hamiltonian a constant of the motion we'll be able to identify the symmetry that makes the lagrangian a constant of the motion and for inverse square forces not just central force but you know the coulomb's law type of force there is a third conserved quantity which is called the runge lenz vector and uh, there is of course a symmetry associated uh, a continuous symmetry which leads to the conservation of runge lenz vector but that is more subtle so that's what is called a dynamical symmetry which i'm going to discuss uh, later okay so but bottom line is it's still a symmetry so it's a symmetry which uh, leads to the conservation of the hamiltonian it's a symmetry that leads to the conservation of angular momentum for the case of free particles it's a symmetry the translational symmetry which leads to the conservation of linear momentum in the case of inverse square forces central force is the uh, dynamical symmetry which uh, leads to the conservation of the runge lenz vector so the moral of this uh, lecture is that pretty much uh, behind every conserved quantity there exists a symmetry a continuous symmetry okay i'm going to stop here and in the next class i will uh, give you all these examples which will convince you about the power and usefulness of this theorem okay so thank you see you in the next lecture mm-hmm.